everyone. Welcome to the fifth episode of Stories of Learning, where we explore the learning process and we use Josh Waitskin's book, The Art of Learning, to guide us down that path. Every week we have a new guest in and we talk with them about their experiences and their stories in this journey of learning. I'm super excited to get into this episode with Dylan DeBiase, so I won't make the intro too long, but I do want to mention quickly that I've started a Patreon page. So if you're into these episodes and you enjoy them and you want to help me make them even better, then you can check out patreon.com forward slash stories of learning. And I'll post the link in the uh, show description. There's cool kind of bonus content that I'll be uploading, pictures and video and, and, and even a Discord server for us all to get together eventually and, and chat with some of the guests live. All right. So without any more delay, we'll get right into it. Enjoy. Well, thanks for being a part of this with me. My pleasure. Yeah, I'm excited. Yeah. So we're going to jump into three different segments. But before we get there, I just want to do a little introduction and, and hear a little bit about what you do and what you're up to and and all that kind of stuff. Cool. Uh, well, my name is Dylan DeBiase, and uh, I'm a bass player and songwriter. Uh, I live in Brooklyn, New York, and I work here. I do a lot of gigging and playing, and I do some teaching as well um, in the area. And then uh, I also have a little side job where I, I uh, teach tennis a few times a week. Um, yeah, <laughs> nice. so get to run around a little bit. Uh, but yeah, I do a lot of gigging with mostly original artists. So a lot of indie rock, indie singer-songwriters, mm. um, and a little bit of theater stuff. Some pit work and stuff like that. Uh, play my own stuff as well. I have a couple bands that I work with. I do some so- some solo work as Dylan DeBiase, and then I have... Uh, I have a band called Wreath that uh, is about to release a record. It's kind of like a an indie emo, bass driven <laughs> kind of badass thing. So yeah, very uh, cool. Yeah, <laughs> I'll definitely uh, I'll definitely post a link for that stuff in the, in the show notes. That's cool. Yeah, when's it get uh, When's the album get released? Well, the album should be coming out early next year, uh, and then we're gonna follow it up with uh, we're going on a release tour, February thirteenth to the twenty seventh. So we're going out for two weeks. Um, Nice. It's going to be a cold weather tour, but we're excited. <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, I think we're going down. We're making a little oval down from the city, down through Atlanta, and then around through like Memphis and up St. Louis and stuff like that, and then hooking back. So it'll be like an oval around the northeast. Uh, I mean, uh, awesome. the the east coast. So yeah. Nice. Be fun. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, man. Very cool. Nice. Well, then let's uh, let's dive into the, the first segment, which is called the soft zone. <laughs> So in this first segment, um, I want to talk about the idea of distraction. So all these segments, as as always, come from uh, Josh Waitzkin's book, The Art of Learning, right. which is a really, really great book about the learning process, and uh, it's kind of my, my guide for these podcast episodes. So in Josh's early chess career, he um, kind of talks about his experience in in high intensity chess moments and having distractions because it's a really focused scenario obviously so little distractions can be enough to throw him off um, his focus so he talks about something simple like getting a song caught in his head and having it repeat over and over and over and then getting distracted by that enough that it messes up his um, his move in the game right so instead of kind of letting that become his his become an issue for him he actually takes it and, and goes home and and plays loud music and and <laughs> while he's practicing and uh, a lot of it is music he doesn't like um and puts puts all that on and and, and learns to take it in and, and use it to help him focus more and the important part is that he doesn't try to shut away his emotions he tries to to take it in and and help that guide him into a, a heavier focus, which is pretty interesting. So I just want to know, like, we can spend plenty of time in our practice rooms with our instruments, but when we get on stage and we have to perform, you don't have time to stop, you don't have time to reset, you don't have any of that opportunity. So when distractions happen on stage, what what do you do to deal with that and and or what do you do to overcome it that's a good question um i think for me 
on stage I actually feel more collected usually um hmm. I'm I think pretty natural uh like I think I came to the to the bass but I really I think in my heart am am kind of a songwriter I just happened to pick a bass and then become a bass player as well and uh hmm. then still kind of use bass as a songwriting tool and um I feel like for me it's more in practicing that I'll get distracted um on stage, mm. I guess distractions do come on stage sometimes, but um, I mean, like I can think of probably a couple times where like I was, you know, getting really into a performance and like moving around a lot and doing my thing, and then <laughs> you know the the cable pops out of the amp. I remember a specific moment yeah. actually in high school when that <laughs> happened, and I was like yeah, toward yeah. the end of the song, and we were at some like w- you know battle of the bands as kids, and it was just <laughs> a super embarrassing moment, but. I think in practicing, it's more where I get distracted, and I think it's been important to try to like hone that in, because um, I'm definitely naturally like a noodler. I, I, you know, I like to like just I'll just go on a, you know, I'll f- be practicing, and then I'll be like, you know, st- something I like will strike me, and then I'll just go on like a 20 minute writing off of that kind of yeah. rant with myself, and then I'll have to rein myself in. And some stuff that I've done, I guess, to really help me with that, um, that I think actually has also helped me on stage when I get distracted in a way. Because the thing about being on stage, too, though, is that you don't you don't want to be too focused, you know, because you want to be letting it flow <laughs> through you and you want to be doing <laughs> your thing. And I think people respond more to that than they yeah. do to seeing someone who's like, you know, crazy intent on on just like what they're doing on the instrument. Um, yeah. you know, they want to see you getting into it. Um, and some of those moments can, can really bring about, you know, like nice feeling for the, for the connectivity of the audience to the artist. Um, yeah. but I was taking, uh, lessons for a little bit with a man named Andres Rotmistrovsky, who's an excellent, mm-hmm. un- incredible Argentinian bass player. He had this thing where, um, we would just do the lesson he would use a cooking timer like a he would just set a cooking timer because he didn't want his phone around him i think that's been a big thing for me where Mm -hmm. it's like don't practice with your phone around you just get your phone away from you yannick Guzdala also is someone who's really into that and i think he's so right about it it's like get rid of your phone so he'd use a cooking timer and he'd just be like okay and this was andres he was like i'm just going to set this cooking timer for 15 minutes and for this 15 minutes i'm only going to work on this one thing whether whatever maybe it's you know take the easiest thing whatever c major arpeggio all up and down the neck you know and it's just 15 minutes it's nothing but if you kind of have the timer like right there you can kind of like gauge where you're at with it and be like all right i don't have much longer to do with this and i think just that little focused exercise really helped me um to just be like okay little by little and then suddenly you're like all right i can do 15 minutes no problem let me take 20 minutes and go in on this little thing and so yeah. I think in terms of eliminating distractions, just like if you were going to slow down a piece, we were talking earlier about slowing down your playing. Um, yeah. It really helps to just pare it down a little bit. And then suddenly you can, you know, avoid distractions for longer and for a little longer the next yeah. time and for a little longer the next time. Um, so I think there's a, you know, half of it is on stage and then half of it is also just in the practice room. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I remember actually seeing you um, perform with with Victor on the the Wooten Woods Experience tour, uh-huh. and you were doing your solo piece, which was awesome. Thanks. And um, and you were super into it, <laughs> and it was really good. And your headstock on your bass hit um, oh, yeah. a <laughs> mic stand, <laughs> and yeah. what was awesome about that was that you were totally unfazed by it. It just uh, just kind of happened, and and some some of us in the audience had like a little chuckle, but sure. it was it was. Yeah. It's totally just part of it, and that was cool. <laughs> you just, yeah. you know, you got to roll with the punches up there, I think, because it's bound yeah. to happen, you know. And 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 what's <laughs> what's the other option, right? Like to stop? Mm-hmm. You're not gonna stop. <laughs> yeah. Um. So yeah, it's uh, it's more fun that way. It creates the memories like that. You know, that moment right there made yeah. it memorable for you, which is cool. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> That's so awesome. Nice. Cool. Well, uh, that that leads into our second our our second segment then, which is investment and loss. So this one's a, an important one for me. It it it's definitely something that I think is important when you're learning something completely new especially. Um but you can use it throughout the learning process. Um and I'm going to use an example from my own kind of musical practice. 
So I can play a decent amount of instruments. I can, I'm decently good at a few different ones. And uh, to some people that sounds impressive. Some people it doesn't. Other people think that that sounds egotistical, which is fine as well. <laughs> um, but in my mind, music is music, and and it can be applied to whatever instrument. Um, and like you said earlier, actually, it's just you just chose bass as the tool to express it, right? So I think that the biggest thing that can hold you back from learning a new instrument is the technical ability that you have at that instrument, the dexterity and the understanding of the physical aspect of it. So this is where investment and loss comes in. I think that the road to learning a new instrument or a new skill to make that happen, I guess, quicker or more efficiently, you have to be willing to lose. You have to, in my in my kind of world, you have to put aside the base that you're really comfortable at and be willing to pick up a new instrument that you're going to fail at for a little while um, in order to get to that, that next step. Um, so I think it's really important to be comfortable with that state of failure um, for, a, for a little while until you get past it. So what's your experience with loss in that way in learning a new instrument or a new skill of some kind so <clears throat> i actually uh, it's funny you ask because i recently i was it's funny uh, you know I, I see a lot of music here in new york which is great it's one of the huge pros about living in the city but um yeah i recently just had this urge i woke up one day and i was like man i really want to learn to drum like i really would like to learn to drum <laughs> and and uh it's you know incredibly hard. It's incredibly <laughs> hard. For me. Um, so I got this like you know it's it's not a great kit. It's like a you know electronic kit, just like a something to practice on. But um, yeah, it's so hard. But what's been really nice about it is that um, even though I kind of stink, um, it's like the the little successes have become such a <laughs> have a, are a bigger deal for me on it. You know. Or I go into yeah. my practice session on drums if I'm just going to be like, all right, I'm really trying to drum for 20 minutes a day or 30 minutes a day. Um, you know, a tiny success in that 30 minutes is like, you know, pushes me forward. Whereas on bass, I feel like I really need to like take a lot of steps or like if I don't get like two hours in, it was, you know, wasn't good, um, which is <laughs> kind of crazy and like ridiculous yeah. and sort of, uh, uh, I guess like counters what i why i started you know why i started to play mm. um yeah so there's also this sort of nagging feeling of like well should you even really spend this time on drums maybe you should just be doing it on bass but yeah. i think in having that experience of like hey look at this small success i made on this instrument and this little step-by-step -step thing and now i can play this beat or now i can whatever and um it's uh it kind of helps you fall in love a little bit once again with the practice uh yeah. with the idea of practice or the um what it means to to sit down and and really force yourself to to get into something that you're not already good at um i yeah. always tell people it's like and i'm literally i'm good at two things bass and tennis and <laughs> those are the two things that i'm good at i'm not good at a lot else <laughs> so I'm, I'm trying to work on a few other things uh and so I think it's it's been a nice sort of awakening and I th think you know I teach like I was saying I teach a few days a week I teach tennis and um yeah I have an a, a couple of adult beginner classes that I teach and that's been such an eye-opening experience for me because mm -hmm. you're seeing these people who are you know 40 plus years old and they're making this effort to completely yeah. go in bl like you know blind to something that they have no experience in and it's been yeah. almost inspiring because at the end of the day, like they're not good, you know, and they, they are maybe yeah. have, they've never even done a sport. So they don't have any, um, you know, concept of like how their body moves or how they can control it. And especially with a sport like tennis, where you have a racket. So there's, you know, something that's between you and the ball that you have to learn how to control. Um, mm -hmm. I think that it's so admirable for people later in their life to really be able to like put themselves in a position where they might be embarrassed or they might be, you know, they're co totally out of their comfort zone for an hour a week and they're just trying. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and it's, it's pretty cool to see. And it's given me sort of a, a nice perspective on, on how maybe I don't do that enough or I should get out mm -hmm. of my comfort zone a little more. And so the drumming thing has contributed to that. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, very cool. And that actually leads really nicely into my last segment, which is changing voice. Again, in Josh's book, he talks about his kind of transition away from the kind of cold-blooded tournaments of chess and, and into more introspective kind of personal exploration of his own creativity in the game. Um, and he explores how he plays and, and why he made that move. How did he feel emotionally when he did that move and, and kind of the, the why behind what he was doing when he was playing. And I think about that a lot with, with playing music, you know, why, why did I do that? Why did I play that way? Why am I even playing in general? Um, and and at this point, he he starts to shift his focus to Tai Chi, and then to Tai Chi Chuan. Um, so he 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 shifts into a new art at that point in his life. And uh, this is where I want to use a quote from from Victor Wooten's book, uh, The Music Lesson. He says, "Life is a lot like music. You've got to put some rest in there." And I think that this is a really important a really important point. And I want to hear what your thoughts are on it. Um, being able to to step away from your instrument, to be to step away from your your field or your your focus, and get some perspective. Is this really what you want to do? Is this really what you want to do in the art? Um, are you doing it for the right reasons? And actually being able to step back and reflect on it. Um, do you have a story about this from from your kind of world as a bassist and as an artist? Yeah. Um... I don't know about a specific story, but I think there's definitely something to be said for learning about music from other things and maybe not realizing that I don't have to be, or not realizing for a while until I feel like I have realized it now, that I don't <laughs> necessarily have to be in my room with my bass to learn about music um, or to learn about what I want to do with music. Yeah, I'm not sure where, but I know that I remember um, it may have been one of the Wooten brothers on the experience tour just telling me that like people really want to, they connect with and they want to hear about life and about, and they want to feel something when they go see music. You know, they don't, they don't necessarily want to see technical proficiency, you know? And uh, so I think you have to have had experiences, you know, it's about, playing that um, expresses those experiences that you've had in life because those are the things that that people relate to and I don't think people can relate as much to you know being you know being able to rip on bass or being able to hmm. whatever um, you know they relate yeah. to a feeling and I think I'm noticing that more and more that a lot of the music I relate to and I feel connected with is so simple and uh, I think more and more that's kind of pushed my direction in what music I want to make. Um, and I've been trying recently to simplify um, in my writing and, uh, and make it so that this may have gone a little stray from your question, but, um, no, but um, you know, I also heard a friend of mine. Um, I don't know him that well. His name is Alex Frondelli. He's an incredible guitarist. I think he's, he's studying at UNT right now. But um, he's uh, he was saying that the goal, and this might have even been a, a paraphrase or a quote from someone else, but the goal being to you know not to be able to to play crazy well and do all this impressive stuff, but to literally play three notes and have someone know that it's you. You know what I mean? And really have a voice. And I think that comes back to what you were saying with with changing your voice or creating a voice on an instrument or outside of music altogether, where it's like yeah. whatever you're doing in life, I think it's is really important to try to have this, uh, not, not necessarily, I mean, unique is nice, but something that people relate to that really is yours and people can be like, oh, that's you know, that's Jordan Rennell's or, you know, that's Dylan yeah. DiBiase or it's like, I was listening to your last podcast and I'm like, you know, that's Richard. He says a few things that yeah. I just know him and yeah. I know Richard Cleveland yeah. and yeah. Um, something that really 
gets to the heart of a person and i think you know people mm-hmm. really connect with that so yeah yeah, yeah there's a i was just pulling up this this quote from a really really nice book called on writing by stephen king um which if you if you're into audiobooks at all it's really awesome because okay, cool. he reads it <laughs> Um, which is really cool. But here's a little quote from that that I think definitely relates to to what we're talking about. He says, it starts with this, put your desk in the corner, and every time you sit down to write, remind yourself why it isn't in the middle of the room. Life isn't a support system for art. It's the other way around. I think that's pretty cool. I I think that, that, yeah, he starts off in that book, he starts off by talking about how he had this big desk and he put it in the middle of his room and 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 he would sit down to write every day <laughs> and um and he realized eventually exactly what you're talking about where you got to have the like your life has to be the priority then you have something to write about right and then we have something to play about and 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 everything like that you know so that's a really really important 100%, point 100%, for sure yeah awesome well that's the end of my my third section that was really nice um so we're going to jump into the lightning round then. Ooh, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> so this is this is uh, my segment that I call Questions to Make Questions, um, which is just for you to answer, for, uh, um, but for people that are listening to think about for themselves as well. first question is what is your life's intention my life's intention um to make and perform original music yeah cool there you go simple as that so then that leads to the next one which is where is your life's attention to make that happen um i guess honing in on on the work i am making on the on the releases that i'm working on um and Mm -hmm. Uh, focusing on recording and booking tours and trying to get it out there yeah yeah really really not trying actually doing getting it out there there you go (laughs) there you go important (laughs) distinction awesome um cool then the last one is what do you know for sure yeah that is that's a a pretty big question i guess um (laughs) uh you know that's yeah that's that's a big question i think there's one thing i don't know if you know this person some some of you may know him um his name is uh he goes by jay ross or jay rizzy and he's uh he's a big advocate for a bunch of musicians and he's out of st louis and he does a lot of cool things and supportive posts and stuff like that for musicians and uh, i once saw one of his posts and it just said (laughs) uh it just said if you're breathing there's still a chance. <laughs> and I love that. I just, <laughs> That's so good. It's just awesome. Um, yeah. And it just made me feel hopeful. And uh, I think that it's so true. It's like, man, if you if you get out of bed and you have a sense of gratitude for just, you know, being there, um, there's still hope for whatever you're, whatever yeah. you're going towards. Yeah. So I think I know that for sure, That's that really there's awesome. still hope if I'm here with whatever I'm yeah. trying to accomplish. So. Yeah, that's awesome. Really nice. Yeah. Cool. Cool, cool. Well, yeah. thanks so much for being uh, a part of the podcast. Oh, it was absolutely my pleasure. Thank you, Jordan. This is so awesome. Yeah. I'll I'll definitely post all the the links to your your bands and the album release and everything like that. Thank notes. you. Cool. So cool. Yeah, awesome. For sure. Yeah. I'll look forward to to hearing the new album. Thank you, man. Yeah, it's an honor. Really been a pleasure. I appreciate your time. <laughs> All right, so that wraps it up for another episode of Stories of Learning. Thanks so much for listening. Be sure to check out the show notes for all the links for Dylan's music and projects. And again, if you want to check out the Patreon, then that's there as well. And feel free to send any stories of your own to storiesoflearningpodcast at gmail.com. And if you send me an audio sample, then I'll include it in one of the next episodes. So we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening. (laughs) 